Well, Mover Nation, live on a Thursday, true to form, ready to go live. Everything shuts down. I don't know why. I, I am kind of, yes, technical problems everywhere. And uh, I guess that's the casualty of when you do this, all of this production yourself. So new camera in place. I have a fabulous guest for you guys today. You guys know him from ABC News, Good Morning America. He's done uh, Ashley Banfield. He's a host on News Nation. My guest, Matt Murphy. We are going to go over the true crime naughty list, and uh, it's going to be a fun episode. On that note, uh, I'm Collier Landry, and hey, <laughs> let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Well, I guess this is the show where we're going to just have to roll, roll with the punches. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah, technically, like, literally starting on, uh, and let me know, sounds good, guys. Um, as you all know, uh, we don't, I don't have a lot of technical difficulties here because I, I, I don't know. I updated software and there, that in is where all the problems begin in the technical world. So uh, thank you all for hanging in. And yes, I have a fabulous guest today. So not only is my, is my esteemed guest and colleague who I met for the first time this year at CrimeCon in Orlando, Florida with my dear friend and girlfriend, as you guys know, Tara Newell, who has known Matt for almost a decade. Uh, and we will get into that later. She'll be joining the program. But um, he is someone who goes from dealing with sharks to actually swimming with sharks. So we're gonna get into that as well. We're gonna debate a little bit on which is worse, serial killers or great white sharks. I think I know what the answer is. Please welcome to the program, Matt Murphy. Matt, how are you, man? Good, good, Collier. So uh, some technical difficulties today, huh? What's that? Oh, you have no idea. Like the, the camera, which is the one that's over this laptop. So I had to prop the, prop the laptop up <clears throat> on stuff that I don't even have on my desk. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? So, <laughs> but here we are, man. Thank you so much for hanging in. Can you do me a favor? Could you turn your phone um, vertical or uh, horizontally? Fabulous. That? Yeah, that's awesome, man. Thank you so much for, uh, for accommodating us and for joining the program. And, you know, I was, um, you know, obviously we met this year at CrimeCon for the first time, which was really cool. And, um, I, uh, I then started going through your Instagram the other day and man, <laughs> you live it up. Yeah. I, uh, I, I love to scuba dive, love to surf. And, uh, the last few years I've been doing a bunch of, um, shark diving down in Mexico, which is a thrill. So, um, yeah, I can't wait to get back down there. And, and regarding your, your other question, um, yeah, serial killers are way worse predators, and um, I'd much rather dive with sharks than hang out with a lot of lawyers too. So, <laughs> all good. Well, that makes total sense, man. Because uh, you know, I was thinking that myself, and I was like, I, I bet you he'd much rather be in nature. They're way more predictable, I think. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. A lot nicer too than a lot of lawyers. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Um, so, hey, man, so I have for uh, for our audience, I compiled the true crime naughty list. And in lieu of Santa joining us, I thought, what better expert to ask than uh, yourself and see what you you know, you've been you've been tackling some cases on the airwaves, especially this Caitlin Armstrong case. And uh, I'm curious what you uh, what you what what is your perspective? Who makes the true crime naughty list this holiday season? Well, they're kind of all, all all stars, right? Um, uh, Brian Koberger would have to be up there. Caitlin Armstrong. Um, you got this new guy in Washington State uh, who has had a pending murder charge for a couple of years, and they just found three more bodies on his property allegedly. So um, we got a pretty distinguished list to choose from for the sort of the worst of the worst. 
Now, this guy who's in, um, who is in Washington State, is this, the, is this the one who was, um, who was uh, luring the, um, the indigenous women that were starting to go missing at the beginning? Or that was, that was in Portland. You know, I can't yeah. keep up with all these. This people. is, I know, this is a guy who's luring people to his property with promises of buried treasure. And he's accused of murdering four people now. Um, but what's interesting about that one is he, for serial killers, um, most of the time there's a sexual component to it. Um, uh -huh. All the greats like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Rodney Alcala. Um, uh, this guy was just murdering for money, apparently. There's no allegations of sexual misconduct which is, I really? think, thankfully rare, but also interesting. Um, uh, I only had one case like that in the 17 years I had with the uh, in the DA's office in the homicide unit, and that was my Hawks murder out of Newport. The couple that got um, tied the anchor and thrown overboard. That guy was a serial killer just murdering people for money, Skylar De Leon. Um, but, yeah, so it's kind of rare. But I think that one's interesting, and his booking photo is great because he's just got a big smirk on his face. So, um, yeah, uh, no shortage of this, um, in the, you know, the business of horrible murders, I guess the business is kind of booming these days, you know, and you, and you have a book coming out this coming year. Um, you're, you're in the, the first draft you just turned in, right? With Hyperion right. books, so, I believe. Yeah. So it's Hyperion publishing. Um, and the editor has the first draft of the manuscript right now. Really excited about that. Um, uh, the The world of traditional publishing is really slow. I'm learning, so hopefully, oh, yeah. um, hopefully, like six or seven months, maybe uh, it'll be out. I'm hoping. Um, so, first book. I'm already. I actually enjoyed the process a lot more than I thought I would, and uh, yeah. So, hopefully, we get we get the notes back soon, and we can start cranking out the um, the remainder of that thing. Now, is this going to cover your sort of history of cases with you? You were at the Orange County District Attorney's Office, correct? Right. So I did 26 years as a deputy DA. And essentially, it, it kind of starts my first week in the homicide unit. Um, what's interesting about the homicide unit in Orange County, they do it a little bit differently than most other jurisdictions across America. They, um, it, there's only eight lawyers that, that will do the homicides for a population of about 3 million people in Orange County, and it's called a vertical unit. So what's different about that is most DA's offices work on an assembly line sort of model where the police will investigate independently, then they put a you know an investigation on the desk of a, one, one prosecutor who reviews it and files charges. Another prosecutor might do the preliminary hearing or go to the grand jury. And then finally, finally you'll get a prosecutor somewhere way down the line um, that will try the case. What they do in Orange County is you actually get assigned the cities. So I had Newport Beach, Costa Mesa, Laguna, and Irvine. So any homicides that took place in those cities for roughly the 17 years I was there would come to me automatically. So you, you're able to develop a relationship with the different detectives. Um, they learn to trust you. They also have somebody, a go-to person they can call in the middle of the night for warrants or for critical moments in the investigation. And what we would do is we would actually go to the scenes ourselves. So I drive down with my investigator, um, middle of the night, meet with the detectives, help out with whatever warrants needed to be worked on, whatever issues might arise. And when you're there as a prosecutor, you can also help to make sure that um, young police officers or brand new detectives don't make any mistakes or sometimes older mis detectives. Um, so you can kind of you can get an ownership of the case right from the very beginning. And then you follow it all the way up. You'd file charges yourself. You'd take it to the grand jury or do the preliminary hearing yourself. So you, you really know every single detail by the time it comes to trial. And I think it's a better it's a better way of doing it. It's better for the victim's families because they have one person that is responsible for everything. Um, it's also it's better on the police. Uh, I think I think there's a better um, legal product that comes out at the end of that. And of course, going to the going to murder scenes yourself really impresses the enormity of it on you as a, as a lawyer. You can see really how, um, how devastating it is to the victim's family. You know, when you're there and family members are literally showing up and you see the reaction on them, it, it definitely, um, it definitely makes an impression on you. So, um, that helps when you're tired at two o'clock in the morning and you want to go to sleep and you have a couple more hours of work to do in trial. Um, so Orange County is a little bit different. 
That's interesting. You know, and it, it's interesting you're talking about a, a victim's forward sort of way and handling these cases. <clears throat> you know, you're, you've now sort of, because you left the prosecutor's office, what, three years ago, you said? Uh, 2019. Yep, August of 2019. Yeah, so you just aged us an extra two years. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I used the COVID cap. <laughs> no. um, <clears throat> so you're thinking, you know, now you're, now you're, giving you're an online you know you're a, a television personality you're on good morning america you're on 2020 abc you know, you're everywhere right when you think about the way that victims are treated in the media or by law enforcement where do you think and where, where in a very in a very brief amount of time where do you think the public at large can can do better you know there's a lot of talk about ethical true crime right and, and this consumption and this obsession of this and how the victims often get lost in the families and what do, you, what do you think that looks like moving forward as we because this this insatiable appetite for true crime is never going to go away well um number one i think that you know if 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 i believe that the true crime universe is bad for victims i would have nothing to do with it you know, and in fact, I've found it's sort of the exact opposite. I think that people have, you know, why do we have funerals for loved ones? Um, you have funerals so that people can come together and um, and and collectively mourn and support the families. And I've never had an experience, at least not in the cases I was actually prosecuting, where victims were mistreated. In fact, uh, you know, most of the journalists I dealt with when I was a DA were were far more professional than um, people might expect. And they were very sensitive, uh, especially, I, you know, I signed a contract with ABC News. I have never seen them be anything but respectful to victims' families. Um, and fundamentally, you know, they're the, the people I work with anyway are good people. So there's a cathartic element to that. Um, when a victim's family sees that, you know, the case has some media interest, the overwhelming um, experience they have, I think, is sympathy and support. And that's not a bad thing. Um, it, you know, and I, I know there, there have been accusations at certain times. Some some people out there in the true crime world will try to exploit victims. I, you know, in the higher end stuff that I do, Good Morning America 2020, I, did, I was on a bunch of datelines. I just haven't really experienced that. And I haven't had a family sure. member in any of the cases I did that had a bad experience. Now, that said, um, you know, the world at large, uh, there there seems to be this new sort of disturbing trend away from victims' rights. Um, we're seeing that in Los Angeles County, where I live. Um, the current elected DA, George Gascon, is not a friend of victims in any way. Um, I represented the families of two murdered police officers, and he seemed far more driven by um, uh, ideological considerations than uh, impact upon the family. Um, in each one of those cases, we fortunately prevailed, but that's a, that's a, that's a disturbing trend. Um, it's new. Uh, it, it keeps me up at night sometimes. Another thing that he did, for example, is he has banned, uh, Los Angeles district attorneys, his deputies from going to prisons and doing what are called lifer hearings where they oppose the release of convicted murderers. And that's a blanket policy he enacted in, in his office that I totally disagree with. And that part of my job for those 17 years in the homicide was actually going to state prison and reviewing um, these lifer hearings. In other words, when convicted murderers come up for parole, you send a deputy there to represent um, the, the public at large, but that almost always involves working with the victim's families, who of course never want the person to be released or virtually never want that. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the pain and suffering that a murder affects upon the, the, uh, the the loved one's family members, the, a family who loses a loved one to murder is never the same after that. And when those people come up for parole, um, you know, the families, you know, under, under California law, they have a right to be heard. But it seems like we have this sort of lurch away from that, which I think is is tragic, personally. It's interesting you mentioned the parole thing, because when I was just back in Ohio last week, <clears throat> I uh, met with a police officer from my case or my father's case or mother's case, however you want to look at it. And he was the one detective that believed me that my father had murdered my mother. And 
I learned a couple of things. And one of those things was that I always said it was kind of like him and I against the war rest of the world, but it really was. He told me that the prosecutor at the time who, who this is, this case essentially had made his career. He didn't want to pursue any of it. He didn't want him investigating my father or anything. And my father of course had a whole version later on down the road, post conviction of a conspiracy theory and all the typical things that people <laughs> who are guilty of crimes do. Uh, you know, capital murder and things like my father being a psychopath, blame game shift, uh, blame shifting, things like that. But the other thing that I learned is that not only were they not going to prosecute him, they were considering not prosecuting him. But now on the flip side, my father is again up for parole and he probably will get out here in the next year, which was kind of flooring to me. Um, and, you know, I mean, he's been incarcerated for almost third, I guess now 35, well, 33 years, 34 years coming up. So 35 years is a long time. But when you talk about sort of system reform and you talk about lifers and things like that, what do you think? How do you think a population can begin to reabsorb offenders? Well, that's a good question. Um, number one, uh, 35 years for a domestic violence homicide is a long time. Okay, so right now, in contrast, for example, the state of California, most domestic violence murders are typically second degree murders. I, I want to just clarify, it was not yep. it was a pre premeditated murder, like he played right. it over six months. Yeah, right, right. So, um, so in California now, a first degree murder, that's a first degree murder. The majority of domestic violence murders, not your case, but a lot of them tend to be like, you know, we're in the holiday season right now. Somebody has too many cocktails. Uh, they, they tend to be more sort of built up anger where they somebody snaps and then a spouse, husband or wife, and there's plenty of women who murder their husbands too, um, winds sure. up dead. Okay. So in the state of California, that a second degree murder is 15 years to life, but with good time, work time credits under recent quote unquote reforms of the California justice system, that means the person gets a parole hearing in 12 years. And they're almost always being released now. Their first, their first hearing is very common, especially when you don't have a deputy DA who's opposing it. So, a murder committed in Los Angeles County, um, a second degree murder, your typical DV murder, that that human life is worth essentially 12 years, according to the California State Legislature. I personally, in my opinion, wow. I absolutely, profoundly disagree with that. I, I don't think that's enough time. Um, a first degree murder uh, is 25 years to life, depending on when the murder is committed currently. Um, and so that's roughly, you know, they wind up getting their parole hearing somewhere between 19 and 20 years, somewhere in that, um, mm -hmm. in that period, um, which is closer to, uh, you know, the ballpark, I think, for the, the proper punishment for taking a human life with premeditation and deliberation. But as far as absorption goes, I'll tell you what, I, you know, I did dozens and dozens of those parole hearings. So part of our job was we would get a county car, drive to a prison somewhere in California with a stack of files to review and um, and see if we we believe that uh, the release of, a, of an inmate should be opposed. There are some guys, you know, that, you know, people that that say a bar fight or even some old gang murders um, where you've got some kid who's 18 years old riding around the backseat of a car and they do a drive by, you know, a lot of those guys, believe it or not, in my opinion, you know, their their greatest ambition in life after spending, you know, a couple decades in state prison would be to sit at home on a couch after a workday and watch a Laker game. You know, they are no more dangerous, I, I think, than a lot of times our next door neighbor might be. And I, I would personally go up there and sometimes not oppose the release, you know, depending on the circumstances. But there's, there's a huge range of um, viciousness, callousness and um, uh, criminality involved in murder. You know, murder is one word that encompasses an entire range of sort of human depravity. They, the, the one common denominator is they take a human life with malice of forethought, right? But there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that falls under that umbrella. And some of, some of those guys are ready to be absorbed, as you put it, right back into society. Today, they could move in next door to me and I would feel comfortable with it, some of them. But there's a lot of others that, um, in my opinion, should never see the light of day again, especially when the family is still hurting and they're still missing their loved one. And, you know, when you, you murder somebody for uh, a se sexual purpose, for example, um, that's uh, 
you know, those people should never get out there. There's no cure for that. They're going to they're going to continue to want to do that once they cross the Rubicon or once they make the decision that they can do that. And it's morally justified in their own mind. All the therapy in the world doesn't help them and they will remain dangerous for as long as they draw breath, um, based on my experience, at least. Um, so there's there's a wide range, uh, depending on who's who's up for parole, who's likely to get out or not get out. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot to it. Did you ever in your in your tenure or even now do you do you do any sort of activity around centered around like restorative justice you know so the term restorative justice actually comes from south africa and their reconciliation um okay and so we there it's it's a buzz term that in my experience a lot of victims have no interest in that restorative justice is the idea that um, you know, like my Daniel Wozniak case, uh, they, they actually took him off of death row. This is a guy who, um, he, he didn't want to get a job. He was a community theater actor. So he puts together this crazy plan to murder his neighbor, uh, who was a war hero from Afghanistan to get his combat pay. And what he does is he, he puts together this idea in his mind that if he can murder, um, his victim and get his ATM card. And then he would use his cell phone to lure another innocent person to the victim's apartment, murder that person and make it look like the, per the, the dead guy was on the run. And that would explain why um, he was still taking money out of his bank account. You know, utterly diabolical. Um, so, you know, without consulting with the families on that, they moved Daniel Wozniak off of death row. And what he did is he, he lured a 22 year old, beautiful young woman named Julie Kibuishi who just got invited by her brother to be in his wedding. And he gave her a tiara because they were all going to wear tiaras. She still had it on her head. He, Wozniak lures her into the victim's apartment, has her bent over the couch and shoots her twice in the head. So he murders two people for hmm. money. Um, and, and on his computer, you know, we, we could, when we got into it forensically, he's literally researching how loud is a gunshot followed by, what like basically what's the best honeymoon for my fiance uh cruise lines and hotels in mexico and then um what's the decibel rating you know like he's you know it, you could read his mind literally by looking at his computer searches and he's trying to figure out how to effectuate this murder in order to go on a honeymoon and the they just moved him off of death row with the idea that well if we give him a job in a regular prison you know, at 22 cents an hour or whatever they make in the laundry, yeah. we'll be able to pay the victims back some restitution, which is was violently opposed, you know, metaphorically sure. by the victim's families. And that. They don't want his money. He's never going to be able to, there's no financial restitution that they're even remotely interested in. And to move him off death row um, to a general population in some prison um, with this ostensible restorative justice thing is kind of a joke to be honest and i mean i th there's a the the father of the war hero his name is steve Hare. he would uh, love to go on your show one day and talk about that so i'd love to have him on anybody and i think that you having had that experience yourself the idea of getting a 200 dollars check for a much softer life for um for some psychopath that murdered their loved one nobody is interested in that unless they're unless they have a you know they're aligned politically. There's there's no normal person who who I encountered in my time, like a, a normal rational human being who's going to trade, you know, um, uh, softer living conditions for the person that murdered their loved one for a hundred dollar check every year. You know, it's that's just that's that's not a real thing. So the the, the term reform, quote unquote, um, it's kind of like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. But yeah. it sounds great. We all want reform for everything, right? Like you, you reform the internet. Maybe that sounds, maybe that's better. You reform <laughs> the technical, our technical abilities to do a podcast like this. Like reform sounds great. Um, but uh, but that that term has been hijacked by people that, um, you know, like in California, and I'm going to expose, you know, some of my, some of my thoughts here. Um, you know, California had a revolving door of violent felons in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And it led to a lot of really um, brutal crimes committed against innocent people. And, and it was capped off by a little girl who got kidnapped out of her house. She was raped and murdered. Her name was Polly Klaus. And that led to actual reforms that led to things like the three strikes law, which is widely misunderstood. Um, 
one strike for violent sex offenders that led to a bunch of things that decreased violent crime in California immensely. And California is tacking away from that right now. Um, there, there's a brand new law that um, the legislature just passed where they're not allowed to use gang enhancements anymore. So for a gang crime, used to be there was a separate enhancement with additional prison time for that okay. that, that really helped those communities um, where the gangsters are from. And one of the findings in the legislative intent that I just read a couple of days ago was that we find that um, that that's racist. Well, in Orange County, I can't tell you how many white supremacist gang members I use that enhancement on. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. it's just um, it's I think my heart look and it goes out to the victims. And that's that's where that's where most of my professional energy was spent. Once you sit down with the grieving mother of a, whose child was murdered by somebody that should have been in prison, um, that's yeah. where my sympathies lie. And, uh, you know, um, I hope I don't offend anybody by saying that. But when I look at some of the some of the decisions that are being made right now, I think that a lot of people in California have forgotten those days of, you know, violent felons getting in and immediately getting out. And we're seeing that in Los Angeles again now. And I just I am pro public safety. Um, I, I walked through 100 murder scenes personally, uh, approximately over the years. And, you know, uh, just the some of those were committed by people that should have been in prison. And when you sit down with a crying mom who lost a loved one for somebody that should have been in prison, uh, that's an experience that you'll never forget. And, um, you know, I think that the, I think the legislature, their first job above and beyond everything else is public safety. And, you know, you got certain people like, like genuine psychopaths and the, the literature and all the scientific studies um, agree with this. There's no, there's no fixing those people. There's no making them better. And when you release them, it's not a difficult mathematical equation. The more violent psychos there are on the streets, the more innocent people are going to be victimized by them. And I, for one, I'm I'm against that. Maybe I'm in a minority these days, but um, I think we can do better. But but look, I'm sorry to give you such a long-winded answer, but no. the nice <laughs> thing about true crime, the nice thing about all these people coming together is that people paying attention to this the public is educating itself. And yeah. I think that one day we will hit critical mass where they will start voting in people that support the police and support, um, you know, good old fashioned, you know, incarceration for violent people that will continue to victimize the innocent if they're out. Um, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm very optimistic of that as well, because people are going to get tired of it. So I guess I, I, I don't want to say I misspoke, but I think that I maybe used the wrong term, but it led to a great, <laughs> a great, com or a great yeah, conversation from you because uh, it's so true. But when I was referring to like restorative justice, I, I wasn't, I didn't know there was this whole paycheck thing. So this is a whole new thing for me. Yeah. I was thinking more of something along the lines of like in my film, I confront my father about murdering my mother. Right. Yeah. Now, obviously, he ultimately denies it, and it's a whole thing, and yada, yada. There are so many people, and I, I reflect on this a lot because I spent a lot of time in prison, not as a guest, but or as a guest, not as an inmate, obviously. Right. But talking to families of incarcerated individuals, talking to incarcerated individuals themselves, not only, of course, my father, who is someone who is a psychopath and who is – who who is entitled and has all these things. And, and, uh, you know, I still think is probably at some, even though he's, he'll, he's 80 years old. I still think he's somewhat of a, of, you know, not the best person to let out of prison, but that is what it is. However, in talking to these other inmates and individuals and ex just even sharing my own personal story of like what I went through or my road to recovery or my road to acceptance of the crime, my healing journey, et cetera. It, it seemed to really land on a lot of inmates' ears of like, there's real consequences outside of our own actions that have happened. And so I'm, as a perpetual optimist, I'm always optimistic that, yeah, there are bad people that will never change, that are just, you know, that are bad, bad people that this won't land on. But I think something, you know, and my father had a, had a cellmate who was convicted of, uh, manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter. And like you were talking about now, all the laws have changed, right? Like, you know, back when my father went to prison, it was 20 years and you, you 21 and a half years, then you go up for parole, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's like, you know, they go the case law. Okay, great. You're, 
you you get 10 years mandatory and on the 10th day, you know the first day you get to walk out or whatever 10 years in one day but i remember he he killed somebody for a DU, dui and uh while intoxicated and he his family they were very politically connected obviously they didn't want to see their only son go to prison but the amount of like of learning and accountability that he wanted to absorb himself and to understand that you know and obviously maybe his his offense was a little bit different than a wanton act of violence or cruelty right but he wanted to learn how to be a better person and then teach others how to not be in his position now obviously sobriety is a big part of that mission but it was the accountability the responsibility the entitled the the feeling of entitlement that i can get into a vehicle i'm fine i can do whatever the process behind his crime and he was always so introspective of that and always wanting to learn more and more and i and when i'm talking about the restorative justice aspect i mean when victims voices are heard on the perpetrators and how that affects them in their process because i would I think some people who are going to be forced to rejoin society need to need to hear that message. You know what I mean? If they're going to be let out and I, and I know what you're talking about, it feels like there's a massive revolving door policy here in California. And, you know, uh, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on no cash bail too, or, or you'd even clarify that for me because um, uh, I know that's a big problem and a hot button. A hot yeah. Button. Well, I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got some thoughts on that for sure. But um but you know, look that. So that's that's when someone has a Watson murder. Um, when somebody is uh, DUI and they and they kill somebody, I did a bunch of those. Oh, the um, Watson case, yeah. Yeah, the Watson cases, and they, you know, I I had one um, where uh, Christopher Darden of OJ fame, who's actually the defense lawyer on it, and wow. this was a man who um, had lived an exemplary life, and he got an argument with his wife. He'd been drinking way too much. Um, the, the, you know, the police come because he threw his cell phone against the wall at one point, they get this massive argument, long story short, he gets behind the wheel and they're still arguing, but the police let him, they let him go to the car to, for her to drive him home. And they watch her drive around the corner. Well, then the fight's back on as soon as the police are out of sight, he forces her over, takes over the, the steering wheel, um, drives 150 miles an hour up the 405 freeway and takes out an entire family going to a 13 year old's birthday party. And it was horrific. There was two people that were permanently disabled. There was a 10 year old boy that was killed. The mother was killed. You know, it's just carnage on the, on the road. But that was one of those cases that you're talking about where this man, I, I believe was genuinely remorseful for what he had done. He had, he had spent a, um, you know, a, a, a lifetime doing the right thing. And he's a young guy. And so it, when it came down to it, um, we came to the, you know, I convicted him of the murders and, you know, I filed those as a murder for the families, you know, for, for what had happened to them because they're totally innocent. They're literally doing everything right on the way to a birthday party. And this guy kills them, you know, and it's just horrible. Um, but at the same time, the prosecutor's job is to remain scrupulously fair throughout the entire process. And you have to have an open mind. And by the time we were done with the trial, um, I believed in my heart that this guy was genuinely remorseful. So we have two murder counts and it came down for the, for sentencing and the judge, you know, this judge was fantastic. His name is Greg Prickett. He's just one, we, he just retired. He was one of the best jurists I ever appeared in front of. He's very thoughtful, um, very wise. It's like what you think of a, a judge is going to be when you're in school, like in yeah. the black row, wise and smart. There, there are a few that live up to that. He was one of them that really did. And and we went into chambers with, with the defense counsel after the conviction. And he said, have you thought about how you want me to sentence? And, and I knew what he was talking about. And you can go consecutive where he got 15 to life plus 15 to life. So 30 years to life plus a bunch of other, other minor, you know, different enhancements and things. And I thought about it really hard. And I thought, you know, I've convicted him of a murder. I think that this is somebody that um, has genuine remorse. And I'm asking the court to sentence concurrent so that he would serve both murder sentences at the same time. And he was released recently. And that's one of those guys that I, you know, I, I believe he's, at least I, I pray he will never be a danger to anybody else. And I think that he felt that because he was a, he was a normal human being. You know, he wasn't like a psycho killer. He wasn't 
one of these horrible, he wasn't like the guy who plotted the murder of his neighbor and that poor innocent girl. This is yeah. a guy who had too much to drink and was super emotional and angry at his wife and caused a horrible accident. So that's a different thing. Um, as far as no cash bail goes, um, again, you know, the communities that a lot of these people profess to want to help, you know, the poorer communities of uh, like Los Angeles, for example, those are the communities where these guys are going to get paroled to. I live in Manhattan Beach and I, you know, I, um, you know, somebody on no cash bail, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be impacted by that. My yeah. neighbor, <laughs> I've got a doctor and an architect on, on one side and the other, you know, yeah. uh, and not that they can't commit crimes, but I'm not in danger of that. For the poorer communities, especially the ones that are that are marginalized, maybe some of the ones that aren't documented, some of them that might even be afraid to call police. Those are the people that are going to suffer the most when yes. when they are these guys get no cash bail. I think I think it's madness. Actually, um, I, I worry about those families. I worry about the communities. I, you know, and look, I grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Um, every kid growing up in in L.A. or going to L.A. Unified that I did has a best friend who's undocumented at one point or another. You go to L.A. Unified, you will have a really good buddy who entered the country from somewhere without papers. And when you look at uh, you look at those families and how nice so many of them are, and as you know, prosecuting homicides out of out of poor areas, you meet all these families. You and a mother's grief, I will tell you right now, a mother's grief at losing a loved one or their child is universal. I don't care how much money they have, I don't care how poor they are, I don't care if they have papers, yep. but they're not have papers. I don't care what race they are. It is exactly the same. It is yes. it is an unbelievable level of grief. And when you do stuff like no cash bail, you are increasing the risk to those communities. And my heart breaks for them. And I think there's a hypocrisy there because, you know, somebody who's engaged in domestic violence who beats up his wife in one of those in one of those poor areas and is released because of no cash bail. You know, and they talk about, well, no violent offenses only and it doesn't apply. And you can find a, you can find a contradiction to virtually everything that they're trying to do on that. And I. I think anybody that understands that issue worries for the innocent in those communities. Um, and I don't think it's fair to them. And they can score some political points by doing that. But I, I think no cash bail. My personal opinion is that it is madness and it is antithetical to public safety. And, and the poorest will suffer the most. It, and that's the point. It's the same thing with like the whole defund the police movement. Uh, you know, and, I, and I've been accused by people, you're a police apologist. And I'm like, let's take common sense, a common sense approach to this. Who gets affected when the police departments aren't able to answer calls? Is it the wealthy people in Beverly Hills? No, because I worked for the city of Beverly Hills. And when COVID was going on, they had the Beverly Hills Police Department, private security, and then another private security firm on top of that three different layers of protection for their citizens they can afford that so if there is no police presence it doesn't matter because they can afford that it's the it is these communities these the you know minority communities these underserved communities that are already reeling from you know the effects of you know socioeconomic situations overcrowding you know lack of opportunity everywhere you look and then all of a sudden they, they are now being reinfestated with, you know, people who should be locked up and they're committing perpetrating crimes in their own communities. They're not driving to, they're like, they're not driving to Manhattan beach. <laughs> they're, they're going to the liquor store around the corner and you know, Southgate, you know what I mean? And I def defund the police. Um, it was an emotional reaction that somehow had a, had a nice chant feel to it, I guess. Yeah. That is, it's not well thought out. And it is, um, look, having worked with police, I've been a lawyer now for 30 years and I've worked with police, um, when I was in the DA's office and I, part of my practice is representing police officers. Now that's a, that's a pretty big part of my practice. And, you know, number one, police officers are human beings and police officers certainly make mistakes. But you talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. Um, the way that works is as soon as you start cutting from police, they don't, the last group to go are the patrolmen or the patrol, the patrol officers that everybody's so mad at after cases like George Floyd. So yeah. before you have any impact on the amount of police officers responding to crime scenes like that, you will go through D.A.R.E. programs, which keeps kids out of gangs. You'll go through the anti-drug programs. You will eliminate the detectives um, we, who solve all the crimes. And, you know, so my background before I got to homicide was in sexual assault. 
defund the police is basically the greatest boon to child molesters imaginable because defunding police means they're cutting detective bureaus and detective bureaus are the ones who deal with sexual assault. Now, statistically, well over half your audience has probably been the victims of sexual assault at some point in their lifetime um, or somebody close to them has. It's, it is yeah. pervasive and ubiquitous in our society and it's a horrific thing. 100%. Those cases are already hard enough to prove without cutting back on the detectives that are allotted to work them. That is a, I mean, that is one, just one of the dumbest things that's ever been chanted in a march in the history of this country. Defund the police. Like, we want them better trained, but defund the police. Like, yeah. it's like there's a there's a great um, Coen Brothers movie where, where they're robbing a bank, right? Like, I think it's... Um, it's raising Arizona where they're going in to rob the bank. And he says, freeze, everybody get on the floor. And the old guy goes, well, which is a young feller you want? I should freeze or you want me to get on the floor? Because if I get on the floor, I'm going to be in motion. Um, which one do you want? You want better police or no police? Because you can't have both. <laughs> Great. Kudos to you for throwing in a, a Coen brothers reference, by the way. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, look, they're, those guys, the Coen brothers are masters of the absurd, right? I and just, their movies are great. But that's the thing. You, we're in the theater of the absurd where it's like, we want better training for the police, but we want to pay them less money. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, the, I, I represent, I got about 10 different, 10 different cases right now where I'm representing police officers. They are, the idea that they're underpaid um, they're asked to run into danger. They're criticized for everything they do. And right now police are, <clears throat> they're beefed. That's the term they use. Like I just, I just had a case two weeks ago where a woman, <clears throat> and I, I'll, I'll keep this vague because the case is still pending and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to run afoul of anybody's, um, pending rights, but there's a woman who was caught stealing from a store. Okay. In Orange County. Mm -hmm. And, um, and literally it's on video. And this, this officer who's already done five theft arrests that day, because he's assigned to this large mall in Southern California, um, he shows up and she's got a bag full of clothes with the tag still on them. And she's got 26 um, of these gift cards. And gift cards are, are used widely in a variety of theft scams. And yeah. so he, and she's got a COVID mask on because it's not a COVID mask so much anymore because they, they do it to obscure their identity, obviously. So she's yes. got a mask on, um, loss prevention catches her. This guy goes in, he asks her to remove her mask so that he can, so that he can interview her. And he takes it off her face and says, um, and she's complaining about that and says, I don't want to get COVID, I don't want to get COVID. And he said, COVID is over. He formally filed a complaint against that officer for telling him that COVID was over. And we're almost a year since uh, our governor, Gavin Newsom, announced the end of the COVID emergency provisions in the state of California. Like the cop said something that was legally correct in every way, but he gets a formal complaint and has to go through admin hearings. He did absolutely nothing wrong. And then, of course, we have the whole video of this whole thing. He was polite. He was patient. He did everything right. And he's going through admin hearings right now. Because this this woman who is an accused thief, even though it's we have to say alleged, even though it's all on video, has yeah. accused him of improper conduct. Every cop in Southern California and probably the nation is is afraid of stuff like that. And that's, that's the type of thing that can impact his career. He's a nice man. He's a six week old baby. This guy's done nothing wrong. He, he's he is. I mean, he checks every box virtually of like the, you know, um, of what you would want as a police officer. Um, and, and yeah, he's got to go through that. And that's, that's life for police officers right now. So, um, it's, that's a really tough thing. And I think we are, we need as a society to rethink that whole thing. Like it, it feels great to chant something like that, yeah. but when you think about the actual real implications of it, and there are cities across America that are actually implementing that, that are cutting back on police, to appease their base politically and they're shooting themselves in the, in the foot by doing it. And then they also, they'll complain when murders aren't getting solved or child molesters aren't getting caught or rapists aren't getting caught. And that's, that's the direct effect, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. It's uh it's um, you know, it is, it's a problem for sure. It's a problem because it affects, it affects the poorest people. It doesn't affect. Yeah. The, the and, and look, I sh I, let me, if you don't mind me, Collier, let me, let me, let me 
to a side note on this, I'm not even a registered Republican, buddy. I've never spent one minute as a Republican. I grew up in California. I went to University of California. Yeah, I'm a of member course. of two different environmental organizations. I lean left on almost every issue that exists as far yeah, as like too. socially, like I am, you know, but when it comes, I'm talking about violent crime and the madness, you know, having seen this firsthand, the madness of some of the stuff that we, that we're reading about and seeing. And the people that are proclaiming it are also often people that know absolutely nothing about the criminal justice system, nothing. how it works, what it's like to be a victim, how police officers actually work. I would encourage everybody who's listening to this, um, you know, if you ever get a chance, do a ride along with your local police department. They'll actually take you out, put you in a patrol car and drive you around or go to your local courthouse and watch a calendar get called one day. Just watch the judge having people come in and and calling their cases in a felony, felony calendar that you'll see firsthand how fair and patient um, the judicial process really is for people that are accused of violent crime. So I, it, it might be a good education. And uh, honestly, it can be entertaining. You know, most people don't want to go to court for entertainment, but, you know, that that used to be what people used, did before TV. So, um, you know, it's it's it, pu- courts are open to the public and anybody can go at any time. Yeah. You know, and you back to the Coen Brothers reference. I rewatched recently Burn After Reading. <laughs> yeah, the one it's the last great, time. too. I did. It's great. But it just Brad seems Pitt. so apropos to what's happening right now. I'm like, right. This movie, this was this movie you made. Yes. I mean, the movie was made, what, 2008 or 2012? I, I, don't, I don't know. A long time ago. And I'm thinking to myself, all of this is so apropos to what we're going through right now. But I, I digress. We have another. Um, I, I want to get into the true crime naughty list. I want to go through who uh who you're looking at for 2024 is going to be still serving justice and um and i want to talk a little bit more about uh this yoga teacher case that you uh caitlin um caitlin montgomery right armstrong caitlin armstrong Armstrong. caitlin armstrong but before that i have somebody who you know uh all too well uh tara newell welcome to the program oh one of my faves thank you how's it going i'm gonna turn my light on here real quick it's getting dark Terry, you missed all the technical difficulties. As you can see, my camera was not working and all kinds of fun stuff. And I'm wearing your shirt, the holiday shirt. Oh, look at that. You got to stand up. There you go. Santa Collier. All right. <laughs> yeah. Wow, nice. And then always have a dog, you know. Terry so, always has to have a dog. And who's the new one's name? So this is actually Collier's dog. This is Marisol, but I have... Dixon, he's somewhere around, and he's like Cash was, but a different color. Oh, I miss Cash. What a great dog. Right? He was so good. But it was, like, good for him to not have any more pain. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, he watched me go through a lot. (laughs) Well, if the Vikings have the afterlife right, uh, Cash has a spot at the at the table in the meat hall (laughs) because he's a hero. Yes. Yes. And then it was so funny seeing you at crime con because just the crowd there sometimes and um, like people were going right up to you and ignoring me and being like, Hey, Matt Murphy. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Yeah. Everybody's really nice at crime con though. I found. So that's my, I think that's the third one they've invited me to. And, um, I have never had a bad encounter. And there, there's, there's a, there was one, one guy this last year who was a little crazy, came up to the table and had like, you know, he's a conspiracy theory guy. Um, uh, he's still nice, but, um, everybody else is just so nice. So yeah. Did, did you have a good time, Tara? Yeah, no, one? it was great. It was really fun. And Collier and I were there. We did the live and then we did, a podcast row and that was fun just meeting everyone and just meeting people that were like oh like hey who are you and then i would tell them the story and they'd be like i think i know that case <laughs> yeah yeah isn't that funny um yeah the uh every once in a while i catch myself getting starstruck at those things you know like i like running into kill korea uh, in Vegas last year, you know, he was the one that Gil was the detective that solved the uh, Richard Ramirez Night Stalker case in the in the 80s. And the guy's just a rock star. And yeah, it's fun. It's fun seeing some of your heroes show up at that thing. 
Okay, so I so I just want to I, I want to because this is the thing that I find interesting about Crime Con because I went for the first time last year in Vegas. How it, uh, you were a civil servant and uh, obviously a lawyer went to law school. How surreal is this <laughs> to go from that to to being because I remember hearing your name last year at Crime Con. Everybody was like, "Oh, Matt Murphy, Matt Murphy." I'm like, "Who who is this guy?" And I'm just there as an observer. I'm just trying to figure out because I'm all, already with Crime Con. I was like, there's a convention for people that are obsessed with true crime. And this is right when I right. Had started my podcast. And I remember going, this is a weird thing. And that was right when I had met Tara. But how surreal is it to show up and have this rabid fan base? I mean, to both of you, when you go to these things. I'll let you answer that, Tara. I, I, it is very surreal. Surreal is a good word, but, but like I said, everybody's just so nice. Um, yeah. What about you, Tara? What was your experience? Well, I think it's different each year because the first year we did a panel and that's when Dirty John was hot. So it was a lot more people coming up to you and um, stopping you and knowing who you are, especially when you're on the magazine and they promote you as that. Our podcast is kind of newer. And so this year it was way different where there was, of course, people that ran up to us and recognized us, but there was people that had no idea who I was. And that was a different experience than I had from the year before. And so it was good to connect on a different level because I felt like the previous year I was kind of on a pedestal in a sense. Okay. And it feels weird. Well, you know? for my two cents, Tara, I think you should always be on a pedestal because you are <laughs> talking about running into my heroes. If I didn't, if I hadn't known you from before, you would have been one of my heroes. So, um, so why don't you guys uh, share how you know each other? <laughs> sure. So, um, so being, uh, you know, uh, like I said, assigned to Newport Beach Police, I got this um, got this call out from my detectives one day that there'd been a homicide in Newport beach. And so I had to, um, I had to review the case and we had to do a little bit of investigative follow-up and it was, it was Tara, which I guess technically Tara, you were considered quote unquote, your name was in the suspect box. Not that everybody, anybody ever considered you a suspect, but they had to fill your name in somewhere. Um, so, uh, Tara, um, Tara is a one in a million Tara. Um, there's a man, uh, John Meehan, who was her former stepdad, I guess we can call him, who attempted to kidnap and murder her. And there's no doubt in my mind or the detective's mind that um, that's what he was going to do. And Tara, with the help of Cash the dog, Tara is such a badass that she she literally like won a fight with a 250 pound man and wound up um, in pure self defense, um, taking his life in the process. Which is, I mean, it, it was. I hate to use the word Tara and I hope you're not offended by it, but in the minds of the detectives and mine and all my colleagues in the homicide unit, as well as any judge that ever would have looked at that. And of course it never got that far. It was awesome because you were the one person, um, that case, that story ends one way every single time. And that's, um, girl in a ditch. That's where that ends up. Young woman in a ditch who has been murdered and we're trying to put it together. And that's from case after case after case, that's that's what we did and then all of a sudden we've got bad guy in a parking lot who was thwarted um it's just it's the it's one of the only happy endings that i ever saw i, I hope that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable tara but um that was like you were an inspiration to me and everybody that i work with well thank you no i really appreciate that being said because now that my story is highly publicized I do get a lot of remarks of, oh, you should be in jail or you, um, you know, <laughs> or like I even had one person, Matt, that was like, oh, I'm talking to the DA from Tara's case. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure the DA is also just different. Uh, you're, you're talking to somebody was talking to the DA from your case. What? Yes, that's what someone told me one time, being like, oh, I'm talking to the DA from Tara's case, like, she's guilty, there's some speculation, they're talking <laughs> to me about it. Well, I I think that might be like, the friend who, like, I, I just had a friend who flew in for the holidays, and she sent me a text, um, 
she was sitting next to a guy at the plant who wouldn't shut up, who kept telling her about the conspiracy of the royal family and how he was best friends with Elon Musk. Um, mm-hmm. So whoever said that might have been the same guy. Um, okay. That's, that's yeah, that's that's absurd. Um, I was the only DA ever on your case. And not only, um, I mean, I hate to say this, but not only was there never any suspicion that you were guilty of anything other than perfect self-defense, there were probably more than one, hypothetically, not that I'm going to confirm it, there's more than one high five going around between detectives and people involved in that because um, you saved, because of your actions, there's untold numbers of people who were saved a lot of emotional and maybe even physical damage at the hands of that guy. So no, that... Whoever told you that was full of crap, I can happily announce with complete certainty because I'm the only one that ever reviewed it. Oh, well, thank you. Well, there's also like Reddit forums about me and Collier and all those great things. So, oh, you know, the Reddit it's, just, forum. <laughs> it's just something that I think people make up. But then me not knowing enough about law enforcement and the laws and everything, I'm like, are they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the answer to that is is a laughable no. Um, so whoever's saying that is is sorry. Um, actually, I'm not sorry. I hope they is a ill informed moron who doesn't know what they're talking about. Self defense exists for a reason. I've never seen a case in 30 years of doing my job that was more obvious self defense than yours. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody that deserved to get stabbed more than John Meehan either, for that matter. Um, <laughs> So, no, that's uh, anybody who says that in a Reddit form or anywhere else is speaking out of pure ignorance. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, but I know there Matt because <laughs> of that situation, you know? Um, well, speaking of bad guys, we have quite a list this year, um, Matt, and um, the naughty list. But you were recently talking about Caitlin Armstrong. So, can you fill me in on what her story is? Sure. So Kaylin Armstrong was essentially involved in a love triangle where um, her boyfriend was a professional uh, off-road bicyclist. And he they broke up for a while and he started seeing a beautiful young woman named Mariah Wilson, um, who was an up-and-coming star in that sport. And they, they dated briefly. And then he got back together with his girlfriend, Kaylin Armstrong. They were living together. And um, Caitlin Armstrong learned about this relationship and essentially began stalking um, her love rival um, who was in town for a race and um, went, went out with, um, with the boyfriend. His name's Colin Strickland. They went, to, they went to the swimming hole and had a couple drinks. And she, he drove her back on his motorcycle, dropped her off at her friend's house where she was staying where she was shot three times, uh, twice in the head, once in the heart. And um, as police started putting it together, they had all these nearby, this is in Austin, Texas, they had all these nearby um, security cameras from all the neighbors. And um, Caitlin Armstrong's black Jeep Cherokee is driving around. um, And because they're all involved in professional off-road cycling, she had this unique setup of bike racks on the car. So as if the plate wasn't enough, there was... A, a super unique back um, one on the back <laughs> and a bike rack on the top. So black 2012 Jeep Grand Cherokee with those bike racks. It's there's probably only one vehicle in the entire United States that looks like that, and it was hers. And um, and then they got the ballistics from the shell casings. It was her gun that was used to 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 kill Mo Wilson. Um, then she fled to Costa Rica when the police started getting getting wise didn't take her along. She sells her car, flees to Costa Rica, gets some plastic surgery done down there. I was teaching yoga to Americans, which is not smart because they will extradite from Costa Rica. And uh, U.S. Marshal's office scoops her up, brings her back. Uh, Took them, I think, 42 days to find her, which is a millisecond in the world of international extraditions, which we did a lot of. Um, and, uh, And then she famously gets this medical appointment outside of jail while she's like, I think it's two weeks before her, her trial is supposed to go. And um, and she she does a runner. She runs, and there's this famous video of her running through a parking lot. I think her hands are still zip tied, and she's trying to climb a fence. And there's some police officer chasing her who keeps falling down. 
Um, it's just like, it's like a Benny Hill skit. So, oh my God. um, not surprisingly, she was convicted and, uh, 90 years, she's right? already been sentenced. Yeah. 90 years. So as I say, don't mess with Texas, uh, 90 year sentence. Um, and what struck uh, me as being so bizarre is this was the first true crime story I ever saw in men's fitness magazine. <coughs> like, wait, like, wait, I'm like, wait, what, what is, what is this? Right. Yeah. Now the, the, the off-road cycling world is a, I think it's, it's increasingly popular. It's an, it's a niche sport, but this guy, Colin Strickland was a, was a pretty big star and Mo Wilson was a world beater. She was, she, some were saying that she might've been one of the best ever. And it's a new, new sport. It's like, um, they do these off, off off-road races and, uh, yeah, right. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's that case. She's, uh, the judge in that case, in particular, I think, was just fantastic. She made she made all the right rulings, let in all the right stuff. Um, really well thought out, very intelligent. I was I was um, really impressed with the prosecution of that, but I was particularly impressed with the judge. So stuff like that does restore your faith a little bit. Um, that was good to see. Um, I, I, we don't have to say alleged anymore because she was convicted, but it's one of those uh, one of those murders that really cap- captured the attention of a lot of people. You know, and speaking of the naughty list, you know, we have Alec Murdaugh who, you know, used his cell phone and you've got, I, I threw Becky Hill also tied to, you know, the Colleton County clerk of courts and you got the Adelsons, that whole debacle and the unfortunate, you know, you know, took 10 years for almost 10 years for that family to get some more justice, you know, for the, for the killing of Dan Markell. But I, I was sitting at the stoplight yesterday. And I live in Santa Monica, not far from you. And I was looked up and I saw cameras and I thought to myself, oh, we don't have red light tickets here in Santa Monica. And then I realized I was like, oh, this is an intersection camera. And I started thinking like, why do people think nowadays? I mean, my father got caught by using a credit card to buy the tarp that he bought with me to wrap my mother's body in. Right there. This and I always say on this program, never underestimate the predictability of stupidity. But why do you think these people, Matt, think that they can just that somehow none of this technology applies to them, or or they'll just never get caught, or they can flee to Costa Rica, which has no extra like like I mean it's it's un it's it's unfathomable to me. Why do you think that they still do this? this ridiculous shit well once you take out things like um like a bar fight or maybe a um i mean some some dy watson murders like we were talking about sort of different animal what yeah when you really break it down taking the life of another human being is about as selfish as you can do whether it's to uh you know avenge your sense of rage or sexual satisfaction or or whatever it is that they're oftentimes, um, accompanies, you know, that mindset, um, is often accompanied by profound arrogance. And, um, and I, I had an old investigator, Larry Montgomery, who was, um, phenomenal. Josh Mankiewicz from Dateline called him the evidence whisperer because Larry was just so, so good. He's retired now, but just great man and a great detective. And we were sitting around in my office one day, kind of spitballing the same question like like what what is it that motivates these guys like because there's so many common themes that you see especially with the mistakes in getting caught and he said they're dice throwers not chess players which i thought was interesting it's like let it all ride on lucky seven and they don't typically think three or four moves ahead and uh, you know thank thank goodness for it um brian koberger allegedly um since his case is still pending he, uh, you know, he, he was a PhD student in criminal, like in PhD. Uh, he was a PhD student <laughs> in, um, uh, I don't know what the exact name of the degree. Yeah. Was, criminal justice or something. Yeah. It was criminal justice, it's just something in that, in that, in that world. So that's all he did was study essentially crimes, forensics, things like that. He was, he was a doctoral candidate and he, you know, is accused of committing murders where he took his cell phone um, with him, you know, and then remembered to turn it off after he'd already left his apartment and then turned it on again before. So it's like 
not only do you have them moving in the same direction as where the murders happened at like two o'clock in the morning, but and not only do you have them coming back right about the time that the killer would have been coming back, but you have that, you know, the conscious, conscious of guilt of that state of mind where he's turning his phone off for like the, the only time he did in probably that entire year, you know, so it's, um, there's a, uh, again, going back to movie lines, there's a great line in Band of Brothers where they, they sneak up on a bunch of Germans that are shooting off into nothing. And one of the soldiers in Band of Brothers says, why would they give their position away when they're shooting at nothing? And there's this pause and the other one goes, because uh, they ain't as smart as me and you. You know, and sometimes there's just no better answer than that. Sometimes it's just people do dumb stuff. And look, murder is never a good idea unless you're a mafia hitman um, or you're compelled to do it because you're like a Ted Bundy or something. It's just it is there's nothing that ever justifies it. And there's, you know, because if there was, it's not called murder anymore. It's a, it's a manslaughter or something else. Um, but yeah. there's, you know, intentionally taking the life of a human being, especially an innocent one is never, ever a good idea. And so that thought process, when I was leaving the DA's office, my old mentor, a man named Lou Rosenblum, who he, he's the one that brought me in homicide and he's brilliant. And he, um, you know, he's doing criminal defense and I'm, I'm doing a little bit of very selective criminal defense these days. And he said, I always remember, never forget the decision making that led to the people getting in trouble does not end <laughs> simply because they're in your office and you decide to represent them. <laughs> and I thought that was that was great. In other words, they make bad decisions. And some of that oftentimes involves um, doing things to get caught, thankfully. <laughs> Sorry. No, no worries. Do you think it's entitlement, Tara? I don't know if it's entitled. I think for certain people, it might be entitlement. I think for other people, it may be, you know, um, they're born with like a smaller Olympic system of their brain. And then they're not taught certain, you know, how to love and how to gain empathy and that kind of thing. Because Dr. Judy Ho actually did an interview with someone who has like a psychopath brain in a sense but he doesn't act like a psychopath he or you know he doesn't go out and murder people for say and he tries to learn to gain empathy to have a normal life i think that that is highly rare but <coughs> it really depends on certain things and you know matt can also talk more to this because that you you know these guys left and right in a sense well, one of the things that's interesting, that's a great point, Tara. Um, you know, when you when you look at serial killers, we all have that that image in our mind of like Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs, right? Like some horribly, tor you know, it puts the lotion in the basket, some horribly tortured soul that is like confused in every way. And, you know, it, it was terribly abused as a child. Um, in my experience, I you know, I did. I mean, I, I did. I did a, I did quite a few serial killer cases. Um, and one of the common things that you see over and over again from Rodney Alcala, or if you look objectively at like Ted Bundy, um, you look at uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, despite the way they portrayed it, they all come from um, homes where there is some degree of love, believe it or not. And a lot of them are spoiled as kids, not abused. I, I did a case with a guy named Andrew Erdialis and the, the defense really dug into his background, two very fine lawyers on that. And, you know, in a death penalty case, you have the guilt phase and the penalty phase. Penalty phase, they're given unlimited resources, basically on an abuse hunt. And they couldn't find anything. Same thing with Rodney Alcala, dating game killer. That was one of my cases. Um, he came from a loving home. Um, he had a genius level IQ. His, he, his mother loved him. His aunt loved him. He had two older, he had an older brother and an older sister. Older brother went to West Point. Um, Wow. Rodney went to Cantwell High School in East LA, which is a really good college prep school. They were in my league. I went to Loyola High and they um, they were in my league. You know, we used to play them every year. And it, like, it's a fine school. He was a varsity letterman, yearbook committee, graduated from UCLA film school and probably murdered 100 people. You oh, know, wow. so um, it's it's an interesting thing. And, and one thing about the the brain, the brain stuff is we are such in the infancy of the science on that they really they understand so little and um that's one of the things that <clears throat> we'd see a lot uh prosecuting cases you'd see defense experts coming in with brain scans and 
and then you, you really break it down and they they know so little about the human brain it's kind of like i think they know more about the universe than they do you know um oh, the, way yeah. the human brain actually works well there's the book behave and with that book there's a lot of research and it's like this person wishes that they could do brain scans on people that are being convicted of murder because you're like some people just have an instant where um you know that football injury to the brain where it's like you have that violent tendency and so it's like he wants to scan people's brain to know why they did it because that may vary how much time that person should get mm -hmm. yeah I, my only caution is on that my only concern would be as soon as we start turning that over to defense experts nobody's going to do any time for, nobody's going to do any prison time for anything they do because everybody's going to go aha look um and those things are you know like the qeeg for example or the or the functional mri they are the, the, they can be impacted by how much food somebody had the night before, how much sleep, you know, what their mood was, any sort of medication, um, you know, for women, um, what time of the month has a huge impact on, on what their brains look like. So there's, there's so many different factors. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm worried about the day that we just turn that over to hired guns and look, I'm a defense lawyer now, so I'm, yeah. I'm all for, I'm all for like lower sentences for my clients. But um, uh, I think that, yeah, we just have a, we have a lot we need to learn about that. But it's fascinating for sure. Yeah. Well, I just think, you know, the football injury to me is very interesting because of the violent tendencies. And it's like, how do we fix that and like also create that awareness around this type of sport? Because so many people especially in certain parts of the country are throwing their kids into football and being like, you know, you're going to be a football star. And I've seen that a lot. And I lived in Texas for a bit and it was a lot of like football and, you know, we need more awareness of like what these brain injuries can do and to lead to certain things. And, you know, I think about domestic violent cases how many of those are even like the people that look like they were like the football star or like the most popular person in school you know it's a lot of times that guy and other guys too but like i think back to the entitlement piece in the not, every, not everyone's aaron hernandez either for sure but i will <laughs> say true. not everyone who is who is uh in football um does commit murder however i want to say as a diehard San Francisco 49ers fan, there will be murder of some dirty birds out of Baltimore <laughs> this coming Monday night. That's what Metaphorical I'm murder. Metaphorical murder. Yeah, my fantasy Metaphorical football team murder. lost last week, so the football season is over whether everybody else realizes it or not. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so my, team, my team is out, which means the season is now which done. Which is who? Oh, my, my fantasy team. I, I've, I've, oh. I've been in a league for the last 20 years with a bunch of buddies from high school. And uh, yeah. my team got, got eliminated heartbreakingly last Sunday. So um, my football season's over. I won't be watching the 49er game. <laughs> I can still remember when I, uh, uh, I, I told my friends who I was in fantasy leagues for basketball. I said, guys, I'm, I'm in California. I just can't keep it. And they were so excited that I quit because I had the best team and they all got my players and they were, they were dividing. <laughs> they had a list all ready to go before I even said I wanted to quit. They're like, if you're going to, if you're going to quit, we want these players from you. Can we have them? I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, yeah. Um, so, all right. We got Caitlin Armstrong. Rex Hoyerman is going to obviously face trial. Chad Daybell. What do you think of this Adelson uh, case? You know, I haven't done any commentary on that, so I don't yeah. I don't know enough about it to say too much. Um, I did a bunch on Lori Vallow, though, and Chad Daybell. That's going to be a really interesting trial. Um, and they are allowing know, the, cameras, correct? I think so. Yeah, they, they did for her trial. So I would have to imagine it's, it's going to be the same. Um, but, you know, we do we know um, having watched the previous trial, we really know most of the nuts and bolts of that thing. Um, but <clears throat> he's in a lot of trouble. I think he's probably, you know, the children are found on his property. And um, that's a that's just a wild case. She she's a very interesting. Um, she's an, a very interesting criminal defendant, that woman, Lori Vallow. Um, 
Yeah, it shows. Uh, I think I think that case shows that you know it's another example of the danger of cults, right? Like especially yes. anything with a doomsday element to it. it um, you know, people that believe ardently in in anything, I guess. Uh, but when you get somebody preaching at them about the end of the world, and in that case, zombies, and you can almost justify anything in your mind. So it's in that case, it's just horrible because it's special eternal music life, among other eternal people. paradise. Yeah. Right. I mean. Yeah, we saw people fly planes into buildings 22 years ago with that promise. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Or Heaven's Gate down in San Diego, yeah, or Heaven David Gate. Koresh, or Jim Jones down in French Guyana. It's yep. uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. Human human beings' capacity for violence is a is a fascinating and terrible thing. Yeah, was it Heaven is. Gates in uh, Fairbanks Ranch? Uh, I was in San Diego someplace. I don't I don't remember. I thought it was in Rancho Bernardo, but um okay. yeah, Rancho about Bernardo. That. Rancho yeah. Bernardo. Okay, because I remember being down there when I was younger and looking at the big mansion where it was. Yeah. And then right. just being like, Oh, that happened there and it, it was really crazy story and very eerie just to be around that. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? This they're hopping on the spaceship that was behind Haley's Comet. Right, which I think would be the worst place for a spaceship to be, like right behind a comet. But again, yeah. what do I know? Well, we think so. Um, Matt, where can my audience find you? So uh, my Instagram handle is Matt Murphy Law um, at Matt Murphy Law. Um, uh, I'm going to be um, continuing to do regular appearances, hopefully, for on Good Morning America, doing uh, crime analysis. I'm doing a bunch of stuff on News Nation with Elizabeth Vargas and also Ashley Banfield. Uh, and then, of course, my, my book coming out with Disney. Um, uh, hopefully, I mean, I'd love to say six months, but it's probably closer to eight months. Um, and then maybe you'll be nice enough to invite me back and we can talk about that. So. Nice. Oh, absolutely. Let me know if you need a forward or anything. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, Matt Murphy, Tara Newell, uh, thank you both so much for joining the program for our True crime naughty list wrap up right before Christmas. Uh, you got any plans uh, this year, Matt? Uh, I'm going to Indonesia in January. So big surf trip with a bunch of buddies. So uh, that's uh, my holiday is going to be spent uh, basically trying to get in some semblance of physical condition for that trip. So that's about oh, yeah. it. That's going to be amazing, though. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It's going to be amazing. So, I'm getting LASIK eye surgery. So I will be. Okay. Uh, tomorrow it morning. works it works i had it done and it's great you'll love it oh fabulous news fabulous uh, all right guys thank you so much for joining the program happy holidays to you thank you for having me guys real pleasure you're welcome bye mover nation we get through another one even with all the technical difficulties i want to say thank you so much to all my channel sponsors to all my channel members uh patreon supporters Thank you so much. Uh, you can just drop a, if you would mind, click the like button, click subscribe. It helps with the algorithm. Uh, please feel free to share this show with you guys. I'm just so appreciative with all of you and you guys putting up with today's, oh man, just technical difficulties. The day, the morning before, but you know what? Technical difficulties are okay today because tomorrow is when I do not want any technical difficulties. That's when I go under, not the knife, the laser to get my eyes fixed. I'm so excited because all of this is kind of blurry, but we'll see next week uh, when I come back, what, what my new outlook on life will be. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, happy holidays to all of you, wherever you're celebrating, however you, however you choose to celebrate, wherever you are and however you may be listening. Thank you so much for making me a part of your day. On that note, I'm calling your Landry. I'll see you on the next one. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash collierlandry. 
You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright, Collier Landry.